You are listening to Walking Home from the ICU. We will be exploring how to save and preserve lives in the ICU. All opinions and views shared are unaffiliated with any organization. Today I have with me Lydia. She is a speech therapist and expert in all things speech therapy and cognition in the ICU. I enjoy it, but I'm not an expert. (laughs) Well, I think you're an expert and we use a lot of your expertise. So I'm excited to have Lydia with us to share with us her practice and her role in the ICU. Thanks for coming, Lydia. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. So tell me a little bit about um, your role in getting patients home from the ICU and how are you able to do that differently here? Being a speech language pathologist in the ICU gives you a lot of awesome opportunities to work with patients who really need our services. Um, One of the interesting things about speech pathology um, that I enjoy on a daily basis for just diversity in my work day, but it's also a piece of the profession that a lot of people aren't aware of in regards to the fact that there are a lot of components to our scope of practice. So if we're looking specifically at ICU patients, we think about all the things that are involved with uh, intubation. So if you have a patient that spends any period of time intubated, um, you're going to have a period of time where the musculature that is responsible for speech, communication, and swallowing is not being utilized naturally. And just like with any other system in our body, if you have a period of time where the musculature and the the neurological framework can't be utilized in the functional way that it needs to be, you're going to have patients with deficits. And really, we don't use speech pathology in hospitals as often as we should, and it's a huge area of new research that's being pursued to try and increase the utilization of speech to look at all of these areas of language and uh, cognitive communication um, disorders that, again, come along with those critical illnesses and situations that we see with patients in the ICU. So it's a diverse um, range of things that we get the opportunity to work with patients on. Um, and what factors from the ICU contribute to the swallowing deficits or what makes them worse? And you see such a variety of impairments in patients. Um, how do you feel like sedation, cessation, and mobility affect your practice? Absolutely, Kaylee. Those are great questions. Um, Specific to the ICU, again, if we think about the types of patients that are sick enough to spend a period of time in the ICU, oftentimes these patients are, whether they're awake or or unconscious, they're oftentimes not able to eat um, and drink normally. So again, you're having this period of time where all of this normal uh, anatomy and musculature can't be utilized. um, And when you compare swallowing deficits in patients that spend, let's say, two to three days on a medicine floor for some kind of um, medical issue that requires a stay in the hospital compared to someone who's in the ICU for three weeks to two months, there's going to be a huge difference in the amount of debility that can um, occur over a period of time where a patient is so limited in their ability to either eat or to speak. Again, you know, we think about the vocal folds as tissue that um, helps us speak and that vibrate to give us the ability to communicate. And if you have a, an intubation tube um, down your throat, those vocal folds are not able to do their job. They're not able to to work the way they need to to not only um, facilitate communication um, in a way that you would have been able to utilize it before your decline and your your intubation period. So Lydia, how does this awake and walking culture impact your practice and the patient outcomes within your focus? That's another great question, Kaylee. So as a speech pathologist who's focusing on swallowing, communication, and cognition, um, having a patient who is spending the days that they're in the ICU as alert and interactive as possible is 
absolutely crucial for helping patients return to function faster. And it also makes a huge uh, difference in helping patients to be aware of their surroundings, receiving communicative information from the caregivers around them. A patient who, who is awake um, is going to be um, spoken to by care providers, by nurses, by family members. They're going to be receiving that receptive language um, information that will in turn keep their brains moving. It, it provides better opportunities for those patients to be involved in their care because a patient who is awake can answer questions about how they're feeling what they need, what their preferences are. Um, as far as the awake and walking goes, when it comes to swallowing, a piece of, of swallow rehabilitation that oftentimes we don't think about until it's almost too late is the idea that dysphagia and aspiration risk can sometimes almost prophylactically be avoided to a certain extent if, if the whole patient is taken to it into account as we're attempting to provide them interventions in the ICU. What I mean by that is if you have a patient who is awake enough to participate with physical therapy, sit at the edge of the bed, do exercises, potentially get up and ambulate, these patients are inflating their lungs, they're using their diaphragms, they are incorporating all of those muscular systems that also are required to preserve cough strength and preserve the ability to clear the airway and help reduce the risk for respiration when people are able to start those swallowing trials. So while a, an intubated patient who is not sedated and up and working with physical therapy can't necessarily do functional swallowing exercises. There's a lot that can be done with speech pathology to maintain the uh, integrity of the oral mucosa. And while all of our nursing staff is educated and trained in performing oral cares, there are pieces of providing oral care that can be uniquely difficult in our intubated ICU patient population, um, especially when we're talking about patients who are dealing with some confusion or issues with orientation. Um, oral aversion is something that can be an acquired problem after being in the ICU where if during a period of time where you were confused, you had no control over the speed of, of someone approaching your mouth or entering your mouth with a swab or a toothbrush, or allowing you breathing breaks between uh, scrubbing attempts in the oral cavity. We can have patients who come out of the ICU with a fear of being touched on the mouth or, or anxiety related to having their face touched and, and having a speech pathologist come in and help you evaluate where that patient is in regards to being able to participate, being able to follow some simple commands and, and be as, as independent as possible with those tasks, not only reduces the risks for, you know, the, the buildup of that really nasty anaerobic bacteria that we see uh, populate patients' mouths when they're not able to eat or drink, um, but it also helps, again, the patient have some control over their situation and avoid some of those, those instances that I mentioned where you can get people who end up really hypersensitive and uh, traumatized over the oral care that was provided to them, even if it was provided with the idea of, of you know, doing a good job and caring for the patient. A speech therapist can really help with uh, putting together a, a, a program with nursing staff to make that as patient-focused and specific as possible. Do you see that aversion increase when patients have been delirious? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. So anything that... Uh, with delirium making it difficult for patients to um, to reason why things are being done to them. You know, we've talked to patients who, you know, who come out of periods of being lethargic and, you know, state the scary things they saw or thought they saw or things that were done to them that felt so real. Um, um, you can really aggravate the risk of those types of um, situations occurring um, when Anytime you're you're dealing with someone's mouth, if we think about it, obviously we're not used to people helping us with oral care as adults. But on top of that, your mouth is the gateway to your lungs and your breathing. And anytime someone else has control over foreign objects in your mouth, including your endotracheal tube, you know, moving that around to do oral care, a lot of care and communication um, needs to be taken during during those times to make sure that we're, we're providing more benefit to the patient than harm. Interesting. Yeah. I'd never thought of it that way. 
So I think speech therapy is really well known for helping people talk, but especially in the ICU for swallowing. Absolutely. So the, you're kind of the gateway to being able to eat again. We get that. Something that I did not understand and I'm still discovering is what a role you can play in cognition evaluation and therapy. Will you please tell us about that? Because I'm really excited about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so glad you're asking. Um, one of the difficulties with being a speech language pathologist, that's my official title, is our, our scope of practice really includes a wide range of items. And we've touched on a few of those here already with swallowing and communication and cognition. But the cognitive piece for our scope of practice, oftentimes people aren't aware is even a part of what we can help with. And one of the ways to help, I think, bring it into focus uh, in regards to how we're able to be utilized with these patients in the ICU who are at risk for delirium is if you think about how the anatomy, you know, going from the, from the, the black and white uh, anatomy of the body, the mouth, the throat, all this anatomy we use to speak and to communicate and eat and drink, um, cognitive processes such as remembering things. Um, being able to sustain your attention to a task or a conversation with your doctor where you have a physician trying to explain to you the, the serious implications of your current medical situation. Um, cognition is almost inextricably linked with communication in that to practice our cognitive abilities with memory and with um, sustained attention and problem solving and those more high level executive functioning um, uh, abilities that are required to take multiple pieces of information and weigh them and make a decision. Um, all of these um, features of cognition are required for us to be able to interact in our world and make decisions related to our lives. And when you're intubated and you're in the ICU, uh, your ability to have stimulation that can continue promoting those skills and keep them um, fresh, uh, for lack of a better word, oftentimes those opportunities are, are limited. And what we've been trying to do um, in the system that I've been working in um, is, again, limit sedation as much as possible for these ICU patients so that we can facilitate their minds being awake and active and actively participating in their care. And again, you know, you think of a very sick ICU patient who is intubated and you think, well, they really can't do much. But if you are aware if you have a patient who's awake and you're aware of what their deficits are because you've had a speech pathologist come in, do a communication assessment, see what the patient has to utilize um, as, um, as uh, tools, whether they're able to write on a pad of paper or use an iPad to communicate using a, a text-to-speech program or... Um, we have patients who aren't able to use their hands for writing or for pointing, and you can use something called an eye gaze board, with a, which allows for options to be placed in the patient's visual field, and caregivers can be trained to, to stand in a correct position to be able to determine what the patient is choosing just with the direction of their eyes. Um, anytime a patient is awake and alert enough to participate um, in interventions with physical therapy, uh, it's a good indication that as a care provider, you should consider a speech language pathology assessment because the likelihood is if they can participate with physical therapy, there's going to be a huge benefit in you having speech pathology come in, do that initial communication assessment, uh, determine the best method for helping a patient communicate, and then with having determined where their specific deficits are, again, whether it's memory or sustained attention or problem solving, you can start functionally using tasks that are functional within the patient's day-to-day -day life um, to, to target these areas and work on improving um, function so that when the patient is extubated and coming out of the ICU and more stabilized, they're not faced with this huge decline in their ability to participate in those activities of daily life that really do require some cognitive functioning. A few examples would be, again, managing and organizing medications. 
um, making an appointment with the physician and making sure that you've contacted the insurance company to have the pre-authorization you need. These are all very complex tasks. And if you've been in the ICU for six weeks, you haven't had the stimulation um, that you need to be able to dive back into those tasks of daily life. And a speech pathologist um, in conjunction with physical therapy and occupational therapy can be very useful in helping you determine where those goals should be targeted for that patient and how not only family and care providers, but the patient themselves can um, um, work on improving these areas of cognitive functioning. And you have brought me so much insight on my patients on numerous occasions. Um, there are patients that can tell you where they're at, um, what day it is, kind of the context, but we all have had those patients where it feels like there's something off, but you can't put your finger on it. So we've asked you to do MOCA scores. Mm -hmm. What is that test? What is it like? And what does it tell us? Good question. So uh, the MOCA is the acronym that uh, stands for the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And it's one of many um, cognitive screenings that are frequently used uh, in the hospital system to assess cognitive functioning. Now, just as a caveat here, uh, I, I need to just make a quick uh, comparison between uh, a more brief cognitive assessment that would be completed in the ICU. The MOCA is a perfect example of that compared to more thorough diagnostic cognitive assessments, which are oftentimes very appropriate and um, can help facilitate a more thorough look into a patient's cognitive status. These exams are usually done when the patient is out of the ICU. Uh, often they can be done as an inpatient or as an outpatient with a speech pathologist or a neuropsychologist. Um, and the rationale behind doing a, a shorter cognitive assessment um, in the ICU is, again, that the patient's attention span is going to be somewhat uh, more limited compared to some of these more uh, diagnostic examinations, which can take three to four hours at a time oh, wow. to complete. That's just not a, an amount of time you can expect um, a lot of these ICU patients to be able to attend functionally to, to a diagnostic assessment. And the MOCA is a great uh, option to utilize that doesn't give us as much information as those more thorough diagnostic assessments, but still does a great job in, in giving you a general idea of where your patient lies on a standardized bell curve of performance um, of a variety of patients. And um, the standardization data for the MOCA is great because it allows us to have some good objective information to compare as the patient progresses um, through their stay in the hospital and beyond. Another benefit to the MOCA is that it uh, is a free source uh, cognitive assessment. Um, at least it has been. They're, I think they're going to make it so that you have to be certified to utilize it soon because they're trying to be more consistent with the training that is required for the exam. But um, as of now, it's still open source. It's available in multiple different languages, and there are multiple versions of the examination. One of the things that I'm sure you, you, know, you mentioned a moment ago, our, our patients in the ICU oftentimes will have variability to their cognitive presentation. You'll have someone who's getting more stable, getting sharper, and then something will happen, and you'll notice for a few days they're not doing as well. Um, or, you know, you'll have someone who's had a very prolonged period of recovery and let's say you did a cognitive assessment when the patient was initially able to participate in that, but then after two or three weeks, the patient is still hospitalized, but you need an updated look at their cognitive functioning. The MOCA is nice because the alternate versions that they have provided are different enough, but still under the umbrella of standardization that you can reassess the patient's cognition without worrying about some of the retesting effects that are seen when you try to complete the same assessment on a patient more than once. So the MOCA has been a very commonly used tool um, within the speech pathology profession. Um, there's always, uh, you know, a, a bit of conversation and agreement and disagreement about what uh, protocols are most appropriate for which patients. And again, I think we have to come back to this idea that each one of the, the settings we work in, we're going to have a slightly different patient population. And you really have to just go on what is most appropriate for your patients. And for us, the MOCA has worked very well. Um, there's a subtest on executive functioning, subtest on attention, immediate memory, uh, delayed memory recall, 
um, reasoning, orientation, and language. And it, it allows for you to just, again, d determine briefly some areas where the patient either is within what would be considered normal cognitive functioning or outside of those boundaries in a way that they could benefit from skilled services. Have you heard of the John Hopkins Adapted Cognitive Assessment for mm -hmm. ICU patients? I haven't. That's an assessment that we are starting to use in the facility that I work in that was put together specifically um, by some um, wonderful people at John Hopkins. And the idea of this assessment is, is that it allows for earlier cognitive assessment specifically of ICU patients who are intubated. And the reason why this exam could be beneficial um, in comparison to the MOCA is for the MOCA to be completed. Um, ideally, you want the patient to be able to hold a pen and draw some lines. Uh, there's a clock drawing task. Um, and for a lot of our um, intubated patients, that's not something that's easy for them to do. And on top of that, uh, for the MOCA, there is a subtest that requires the patient repeat back a few sentences. If you have an endotracheal mm -hmm. tube in, that's a much harder task to accomplish, but it's a very important part of the cognitive assessments because oftentimes if we've had cognitive declines, those are, are, are um, visible when um, assessing the patient's ability to comprehend language, retain language in the mind, and then repeat language in the form of a, a sentence repetition. And that's not something that a, an intubated patient is able to do. So the John Hopkins Adapted Cognitive Exam is set up in a way that the patient is asked questions, they are given the options for the potential answers for the questions, they're given the options a few times, and it's, it's put together in a way that the patient just needs to be awake and to be able to signal to you basically a yes or a no, whether that's with blinking or a thumbs up or a thumbs down or pointing, and it's really enabled us to have a good tool to look closer at cognition in these patients who are intubated, and in, historically, in a lot of systems, even today, you know, this is all newer research that you're embarking on with ICU delirium. Um, a lot of systems, cognition is not touched until the patient has either left the ICU and is on the acute care floors, or I would say in more cases, cognition is not touched at all or isn't touched until the patient is an outpatient. And oftentimes the argument for that is, well, you know, the patient's in the hospital, we need to target um, medically pertinent um, conditions and concerns and other things can be targeted when the patient is no longer an inpatient. But I think this population of, of patients that we're discussing who are at such a high risk for ICU delirium, this is the perfect opportunity for more research to be done and more focus to be um, put on the idea that if we could start these interventions with these patients when they're alert and oriented enough to their, their surroundings to participate in physical therapy, that they should be starting with cognitive interventions that are appropriate to their level of function and um, can continue that process of stimulation and reduce the number of days that that cognitive decline is allowed to continue occurring. Yeah, that is such a strong point because, I mean, really all of this is completely irrelevant if patients are on sedation. And when that is still our standard practice around the country and even world, um, then cognitive function is something that has to be cleaned up later. Um, so what does it mean to you in your practice and, I don't know, your fulfillment in your career to be able to work with patients during their acute and critical illness? Um, what does it mean to be able to do these kind of therapies during that? And what kind of impact does it have on their outcomes? I think the benefit that speech pathologist interventions can provide to these ICU patients in improving their outcomes um, is absolutely a crucial uh, service um, that is starting to get more um, volume in regards to the benefit it provides, but absolutely needs more awareness brought to it. Because again, you know, we, we talk about how these patients in the ICU are so ill that they're not able to participate in normal human interactions that we would have on a day-to-day -day basis, a normal conversation, you know, follow along with a joke that's um, pertinent to the situation at hand. And um, that in and of itself takes away a lot of 
someone's humanity. When you cannot functionally communicate your wants and your needs with the people around you and have a semblance of orientation to where you are and why you're doing what you're doing, um, it's easy to lose yourself and it's easy to feel like you don't have a part to play in not only your life, but your, your recovery. And the more we can identify these cognitive deficits and these, these breaks in ability to communicate um, wants and needs, the more we can help patients maintain their individuality and their humanity and keep them involved in the process of getting better um, as a human being and not just another uh, piece of equipment in the hospital room that is looked over you know, as people come in and out and do their jobs. Um, there's a lot of uh, job satisfaction that I get out of feeling like getting into these interventions with patients and utilizing um, uh, external strategies, let's say just even a little memory book or a planner that a patient can use to write down the activities of the day or take a peek at the calendar a few times and mark off which days have occurred and write down some important events in that person's life that are occurring that month, birthdays, anniversaries, things that don't have anything to do with the patient being sick in the hospital. These are the ties to our lives that help us remember why we like to be alive and who we are as a human. And I think that not only patients in the ICU can, can become out of touch with that when they've been sick for so long, but as care providers, it's easy for us to get out of touch with the fact that the people we're, we're taking care of are just that, they're people. And making it a priority to capitalize on this important time in the ICU where we can be of use and we can be of help for these patients providing physical therapy and occupational therapy and cognitive and swallow interventions, communication interventions that are all aimed at improving functional ability and quality of life um, and control over one situation. You know, as I say that out loud, how could it be anything other than the way things should be? Like we should be promoting this in every hospital all over the world. I'm so excited to see our sedation practices change so that your field, your expertise can be used more because we have such a need to give our patients human, like you said. You said it so beautifully. So thank you for caring about their brains, caring about their swallows, keeping them comfortable, keeping them progressing in the back of their lives. It's an honor to work with you and your whole field. We love what you do in the ICU and we'll keep using you. Kaylee, I'm absolutely honored to be a part of this discussion, and it's my pleasure and joy to work with these patients. If you want to join in on the conversation, leave a voicemail at 801-784-0472 or reach out to me on Twitter.